Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to TNA with the last years of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mitkoski Lover, but the printer of Dalstroy. Sergei Dmitrievich Solovyev cursed as his hands slipped from the shovel, his hands long applied to the delicate work required of typesetting, were wholly unsuited to manual labor. That, however, was all he knew he could expect for a very long time. He remembered that night in his printing shop. True enough, what he had known to be inevitable had finally occurred. The RFP had discovered his little effort of resistance, but apparently he wasn't important enough for them to spend the effort on disappearing, and so he found himself here. The Dalstoy was, ostensibly, a public works program, as he and others were now experiencing firsthand. However, the program was little more than a way to imprison dissidents and other undesirables, while working them to the bone besides. He recognized others who had rebelled in their own small ways against the party, and now they were all beside each other, digging trenches for railway lines and ties. One day he knew things would change, they had to, but for now, seeing the hard-eyed look of the overseer and wanting to avoid the fate he had been doled out to others, seen doled out to others who worked so slowly, or worked too slowly, he put his thoughts aside and picked up the shovel. There was work to be done. His abilities used in a more appropriate manner. Inside the Ministries of National Renewal, the state of a uh, state. The stability of our state. Let's get some more stability. Inside the Ministries. Uh, if, if you want to reread uh, the first coat of paint, please go right ahead. Not much, but there you go. Oh, Havaz is a skill in many great things. He is a talented writer, thinker, and politician. However, even a man as eminent as he cannot run the government alone. Seven ministries will be established in order to handle running the government of the National Republic. There are to be foreign affairs, treasury, education, police and justice, defense, public economy, and labor. The chief ministers of these seven ministries will be appointed by the Vaz and obliged to follow his direction. Should the Vaz choose to remove such appointments, he reserves the right to do so at any time. Factualism rears its head. How would you look at that? The recent party congress has triggered a phenomenon previously unheard of in Magadan's halls of power, the formation of factions. As part of Matkowski's token reforms to the political system, opportunities to express dissent within the National Labor Party have grown, and a number of politicians have decided to take advantage of these to attempt to change the government's course. Matkowski's personal faction, the so-called laborists, remain the largest bloc, an eclectic mix of moderate fascists, national conservatives, and personal loyalists of the Vaz. This is a status quo wing of the party, advocating very slow, moderated political reform under the umbrella of a single-party state. Even with the opposition more visible than within the state apparatus, the laborers hold nearly all power in practice just the way that Mikoski would like it. In many ways, reform only generates more appetite for reform, and this certainly applies in Siberia just as anywhere else. Protesting single-party rule, Nikolai Petlin has formed his own reformist wing of the party, one composed of advocates for a genuinely democratic system. Mikoski's interest in political change only goes so far. His distrust for Petlin is well known, and the reformists can be expected to be an underrepresented if loud section of the party. Bringing up the rear is the old guard, but a practically vestigial wing of the party led by the fascist hardliners, as there is practically no desire for Rozhevsky style return to extremist ideals among the populace or political class. The hardliners are isolated and powerless, mostly made up of obscure and effectual figures. Many speculate that they are kept around as merely a negative comparison to Mankowski's moderate rule and scapegoats for its worst decisions. This new era signals unprecedented pluralism, as well as unprecedented conflict within the party. Only time will tell the SNR is significantly impacted by the decision. New rifts reveal themselves. Authoritarian Democracy Party as uh, Petlin, huh? Despotism. Uh, for, for. Oh, there we go now. Mikovsky, Petlin. Cool. And then the stability of our state. In many ways, our state is far more insecure than it was even years ago. Our borders are cleaner and easier to defend. We've managed to take a hold of the entirety of the Far East, and our military has never been stronger. However, in many more arguable, important ways, the nation is far more unstable than it ever was before. We're struggling to administer an area and population far larger than our government was originally intended to administrate. Ideological rebels are popping up all over the place, and loyalty to the Vaz is becoming ever more nebulous and unreliable. There are m several means through which we could address these issues, whether it be through political changes or just by directly dealing with the dissent. Whatever we choose, we must work to implement the changes quickly in order to maintain the stability of our state. A brief glimpse of daylight. Nikolai Petlin uh, scraped together his fork across the plate for about the fifth time since the last bit of meat he'd been picked clean. Embroiled in thought, he continued to swirl the bits of sauce and grease that remained in his mind wandered. The taint of fascism was running deeper and deeper in Magadan, with every passing day, stretching its tendrils across its fair country and tightening its grip. There was an anger there, for, for sure, but there was also an optimism coupled with a tug of despair. It was his duty to rid what was once a protective measure. Now a vile curse from Hobbin and Russia at large, just as he was about to scrape the plate once again. He heard his wife pipe up from across the table. It'll work out. I have faith in you, spoke Lydia, already knowing what was tearing at her husband. It haunted her too, in fact. Every facet of Magadan reeked of the RFP and by extension her late husband. Ex-husband, wow. Rajeski, whoa. Will it? There's so much work to be done, Lydia. Mikowski rules like a butcher, and every day it seems like freedom gets further and further away, and fascism gets stronger, replied Nikolai. Someone has to do it, Nikolai. Gladly that that person's you, but you don't have to do it alone. I know these types. Heck, I was married to one. They're strong men. Mikowski is a man who rules by fear and brutality. A force of freedom will still always topple pa paper tiger like him. 
Thank you, nodded Nikolai. The burden was not entirely ease, but at least he had some measure of reassurance. But more so, he simply wanted out of the conversation. So with a stiff upper lip, he picked up this plate and placed it in the sink before heading off to a study, his mind abuzz with the same witch's brew of emotions. A drop of hope still goes a long way, though. Um, okay, so the Vaz supporters are the laborists. And then to his left lies Nikolai Petlin and his clique, the reformists. And then there's the old guard, a ramshackle. Should one of the main wings manage to solidify power, the future of the Siberian National Republic would be there as a shape. Neither faction is most influential. So I asked you guys yesterday whether we should choose, um, which route we should go. And at the time of this recording, there's a ton of support, ton, a lot more support for the reformists, which is Petlin's faction. However, I did tell somebody that I would do a full, pure uh, Minkowski run. So here are my thoughts. We'll do both. Um, I think for this one, let's just do with Mikoski first, because I said we do that originally. We're going to go full labor su support first. And then when we finish the campaign, we'll come back and we'll do, well, the campaign, finish Mikoski's side and come back and do the reformist side. So we'll do that side as well. So we'll do both sides to please, hopefully, both sides here. So I apologize if we're not doing exactly what you want originally, but I can't please everybody. And uh, yeah, you know, spend more on the military. It's fine. Cool. So my apologies. So we're going to go with Mikoski for this one. And actually, you know what? Since we're here, you might as well save, right? So, and you know what? I'm going to detail the save with you guys. Uh, uh, before choosing dash Magadan. Magadan, we do have a cup of coffee to keep us nice and warm as well, though. And there was a comment saying that, hey, we should do Petlin sometime. I'm like, okay, yeah. Actually, we're probably going to do it now, too. Sway the corporations, laborists, despotists, weak and reformists. Hmm. We can labor. So for now, we'll sway the corporations, probably. Yeah, that's that one. Oh, we have some Burgundian system here, too? Oh, Lev Pavlov, yes. Yes. Keep going, Lev. Keep doing a good job. Yeah, we've got to keep boosting stuff because we need more artillery, anti tank, APCs, motorized, too, even, huh? It's pretty bad. Stabilizer state. And. As well as national renewal. The Russian people are some of the greatest on the earth. We've endured hardship unparalleled at the hands of the German menace. That monster which bent Europe to its will and broke all the empires living on this continent. It was only us, the Russians, who got back up and mobilized to fight the Reich once more. We've alone fought on, without aid and without respite. Even in defeat, we managed to strike a crippling blow against a Nazi giant, destroying its economy and exposing its weakness to the world. The Russian people remain strong, even though these decades of humiliation and loss. Under our Vaz leadership, the world will see our strength again. We love jets. And, yeah, that's not bad. Really suppressing the other side. The way the wind blows. Former captain of the Pacific Fleet, Dmitry Kalenko, was an old man. He had enlisted in the Soviet Navy. When he was a young man, he had risen through the ranks with enthusiasm that cannot, of course, be matched. When he was first made a uh, captain, he had been given command of the Kirov-class cruiser Kalinin. He had fallen in love with that ship. She had been his first and his last command. <clears throat> when well, the Great Patriotic War came to a close and the Presidium fled to Irkutsk, it served admirably. Against the IJN in the last offensive, when Admiral Yumashev took the fleet to Kamchatka, he had personally ensured the cohesion of his task force. The fleet's fall to the father and the Magadan had been the last straw for many of his fellow sailors. Those who did not find work with the new regional hegemon found themselves drifting and drowning their sorrows in booze. Hey, kind of like me. As Dimitri looked out of the docked merchant ships in the port of Magadan, he thought about his situation. The new rulers of the Far East turned into something. He was forced to do things he had regretted in order to keep the Kalinin and her sisters afloat, but even he could not find it in himself to be generous towards members of the Russian fascist party. Looking out towards the horizon, he contemplated once again whether or not he should leave the country. Perhaps he would take charter passage to the trade ship to America, or go west steeper into the former Union. He wondered whether his old friend Admiral Yumashev would approve of the Siberian National Republic and what it stood for. Would he begrudge his decision to abandon his old man for greener shores? Would he support him staying in this new country? In truth, he, didn't, he knew it didn't matter. It would all come down to his own decision at the end. Dmitri looked out over the waters of his homeland for once more, one more time, taking in the salt air and the sound of the dock workers. With tears pooling in his corners of his eyes, he walked to the end of the docks. There was a ship there accepting passengers to the America. The final voyage of an old sailor. So, like I said, we're going to go down with the... <clears throat> Labors for now. So, yeah. Ooh, just straight on the budget, which I do want to do, but... Open immigration, strengthen laborists. Uh, it's not bad, not bad. Uh, and just XP does go up, too. A form of block shift. So you do get more political power that way, too. I like that. It, but then you lose more political power, which kind of sucks. Long arm the SIA. It's going to be costing us more, but we get more political power barely. But, yeah. Long arm the SIA. But actually, you know what? Screw it. I want to get rid of the administrative strain. Uh... Actually, how much is that? Is, is the strain hurting us? 
14% is pretty bad. We gotta give her that first. By the way, the Vaz. The Vaz didn't rise to supreme power in the nation by simply waltzing in and finding a large desk to sit at. It took years of work, political knowledge, and wisdom to be able to get where he is today. The Vaz has little need of the assistance of lesser men, especially those who are incapable of coming to power themselves. No. Only the will and authority of Mankowski is needed in these lands. The suggestion that he would even need such assistance is foolish. An idea has an idea to be abandoned. Nice. 1.53 says it seemed like a lot, but whatever. We can improve relations, but we gotta wait. We can wait for that. Honestly, I don't think we need to do very much here. I mean, laborers faction, we're gonna go down that way anyways. 31%, 24%, and 36%. There's a lot of faction support. <clears throat> but one, we're going down this way. It won't really matter too much. Because we get more support for despotism anyways. We could mix and match, but eh. I think we'll be okay. This coffee's pretty good too. Nice. The battle for Italy. Well, we're not battling for Italy, and that's a good good thing with me. And one nation under God. Even the contemplating rule by any other authority than the Vaz himself is a tantamount to treason. A federal government would do nothing but foster separatist sentiments and hinder the efficiency that a single overall government offers. Given that many of the territories we have in our nation were previously self-governing and at war with us at some point, it's probable that the people might harbor grudges and elect officials hostile to our rule. Such a security risk could end up crippling the nation down the line should these local administrations ever choose to secede. No, the state will remain centralized, at least for now. Trucks, because we could literally use some more trucks right now. Cool. Hey, more divisions? Nice. Yeah, keep training for now if you need to. By the will of the Vaz, an internal communication sent this morning to senior members of the government. The Vaz has flatly rejected our proposal to establish a legislature, confirming his intention to remain the sole authority, executive or otherwise, within the National Republic. <clears throat> the push. <clears throat> For a national parliament, led by the so-called reformist wing of the National Labor Party, led by Nik Nikolai Petlin, and envisaged as a revival of the Tsarist era, Zemsky Sabor, was one of the faction's primary goals. It is as yet unknown what the effect of this rejection will be, though many within the party expect it to be significant. The reformists, uh, as expected, are enraged by the decision, but even members of the Vaz's own laborists have displayed unease. Though they, of course, support the absolute primacy of the Vaz, they see a division within the party, a especially significant division, as evidence in the response to such decisions, as an inherently destabilizing and worrying trend. Many are predicting the struggle for power between the factions to grow only more intense, and while others are making seemingly futile appeals for unity in the face of the Republic's many enemies, foreign and domestic alike. Indeed, <clears throat> although to the Republic at large, the National Labor Party is a mo monolithic one, <clears throat> it's becoming clear that the divisions within it are deeper than ever. One nation, one ruler, one Vaz. Long arm of the SIA. Revolutionaries, radicals, and separatists know only one language, and that's force. Playing political games and giving these fanatics rights will only serve to further embolden them. From now on, the State Intelligence Agency will be given far more leeway in dealing with their dissent. The SIA will be given a carte blanche to go after whoever is deemed to be a threat to the government and dispatched by any means deemed necessary. These dissidents will either learn how to get along as part of our country and political system or be forcefully taught how by the SIA. Nice. Nice. A single nation under God. Under Vazd. Hey, Peace Conference. Right. 65, keep going with that one for now. Who lost? Who died? Oh, there's, oh, they're struggling with Onega. Usually when I play, I usually struggle with Onega to begin with as well, but still. Oh. Yes. Oh. Oh, now there's Onega. Goodbye. Um, Letter of the Law. Return to Habin. Either one of these doesn't seem really all that great. I don't want to get this one. Nat Manifesto? Oh, we get this one too. We lose political power. That sucks. Um, return to Habib. Although the Russian fascist party wasn't as modern or progressive as the Russian National Labor Party, it did great things for our nation and Russia as a whole while it was active. Additionally, though they had their flaws and nothing else, the fascists of the Russian, Russian fascist party love Russia and the Russian people. We would be remiss if we were to blindly reject the methods and means through which the party brought our nation to greatness. Instead of looking to countries like the U.S. or for inspiration, we should stick to what's been successful for us and pursue the dream of a reunified Russia our own way. Spending is A-OK -okay with us. No. Oh, Brigadier is cool, huh? There we go. Now I'll do that. Nice. Very good. Do we have any more here? No. Oh, yeah. That's fine.
God, we just don't have enough of anything here. Far East has no industry. We're done to hop in. And, oh, hello. And then a manifesto of national labor. <clears throat> Recently, Avaz Mikovsky penned a political manifesto, one which will surely be shared in the highest halls of power across the world, on his new ideology of national cynicalism. The manifesto, divided into four sections, describes the movement's several objectives in political, social, military, and financial fields. Such objectives include universal suffrage, the nationalization of the armaments industry, reorganization of the railway and transportation sector, and reduction of the retirement age from 65 to 55. Wow! Some have even drawn parallels between Avaz's work and other similar manifestos from the 30s, however. They are simply failing to recognize our leader's inherent greatness. Do not question the Vaz. He knows what he is doing. And then the letter of the law. As part of our various reforms and state modernization plans, the executive office of the Vaz will be given veto powers on any laws or reforms proposed by the party. This new reform is to bring our national public in line with other major nations like Germany, Japan, and of course the U.S. The executive office of power and the government, the Fuhrer, Emperor, and President have all have veto power in the governments and can shoot down policy and proposals deemed harmful to the country. We would only be following in the footsteps of these larger, more successful nations implementing our own form of veto power. Absolutely. Oh, uh, do we need... Yeah, we probably also need the... Ta oh, hello. What do we what do we get the tanks? Do we need the guns, really? Yeah, we do. Holy crap. We do need guns. We're not even focusing on, like, social laws either, which kind of sucks, but whatever. And subsidize Radio Free Magadan. A number of years back, Radio Free Magadan broadcasted live shows and news bulletins for all the nation. However, unfortunately, as time got tougher, the government could no longer afford to keep the service running. Not only was it draining government funds, but also determined to be of negligible utility, as most in Magadan were at the time didn't even own radios. Times have changed now, and Magadan is more prosperous than it once was. More people have radios, and the government has more money. It could be beneficial for us to restart the radio service. This time, we're strictly under government control. Yeah, sounds like a good idea. Government control. That's what we all love here. Government, government, government control. Training division is not bad, though, especially for these guys. I'm, I'm glad the Novus will be a I'll be honest. I'm really glad they died, so it makes it easier for us. Because who wants a super heavy challenge? Sometimes we do. Sometimes we actually really do. <clears throat> and during the will of people... I don't want to do this, but the All-Russian Council of Corporations, because we lose so much political power. We do get more factory output quite a bit, though, which is pretty good. A new council of industries will be established, known as the All-Russian Council of Corporations. This council will advise and weigh in on government policy, helping us steer our policy in such a direction that will benefit the economy overall. The member of these groups will be elected from coalitions of companies and corporations that work in any particular industry. For example, the mining industry will have its own representative, as well as manufacturing and communications, hopefully. Such an organization will serve to only improve the wealth of the nation and put Russia back on a path to prosperity. <clears throat> Oh, for the love of God, I hope it does. Look at that. 44%. We love it. Absolutely love it. Keep building, 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 because this is about a billion now, which sucks, but whatever. We need it. We have got to have it. Goodbye, Poland. Improve weapons. Um, That's fine. Russian victory in the Northern War? Oh. Look. They've crushed up several fins. A radio, uh, free radio. Though the government has finally agreed to subsidize Radio Free Magadan, this decision has, doesn't necessarily come with a, without a price on the radio. Many laborers have called for the radical reform of the radio and the replacement of the hosts who have quickly grown on the people, to the surprise of everyone except perhaps Sergei. This will be done to ensure the loyalty of the radio to the state and make it a useful tool for spreading fascist truth, of course. As neither Sergei nor Vasily are thought of very highly by the laborists, with some whispering that the feeling is mutual, they would probably have to be disposed of to ensure that they make no attempts at subversion as revenge for their dismissal. On the other hand, a form of call the hosts for the hosts to remain due to their popularity and the maintenance of the freedom of their content for the radio to live up to its name, with mandated changes only as necessary as improve the efficiency of the radio's operation. All that remains is to follow the final decision, of course, to be made. No loyalty without freedom. There's no freedom without loyalty. The enduring will of the people. As the heirs of Hobbin, we've endured many hardships, infighting, collapse, and the war has been a constant thing this past decade. The world has been exceptionally cruel to our small nation. However, we endured. We fought tooth and nail to save our nation and our people. And not only did we succeed, we managed to bring peace and stability to all the Far East. For once, the future of the National Republic is bright, even brighter perhaps than our neighbors of the West. It's our time now, we will bring Russia back under the banner, no matter the cost. Free name only. A teenage girl by the name of Galina Alexandrovna 
living a relatively comfortable but ordinary life in the town of Magadan, excitedly rushed down to sit at her family's dining room table, where the radio was located in the center where parents already sat. It was time for Radio Free Magadan's latest broadcast, and Galena's family had made something of a family event lately, although listening to each broadcast only after a long day. Not only were there much else to do, not much else to do around the town with the family, but still, well, what are we waiting for? Turn it on, turn it on! Galena's father chuckled at her impatience and complied. However, the voice that awaited them was unfamiliar, and as cold as the Siberian weather. Good day to all tuning in, as you might have already guessed, the old hosts. Galena could hear the man's contempt for them in his voice. Are no longer present. They've been taken away for subversive activities, and as such, the Russian fascist party will now be operating Radio Free Magadan directly. As they were to emphasize this point, two gunshots rang out in the background as after a pausing moment. A uh, new host decided to ignore it, but did not have to comment on it, for Galina to know who had just been killed. I'll discuss the news in just a moment, but first, join me in pledging allegiance to a righteous Vaz Minkowski. O oh, Minkowski, Vaz of all Russians, bring glory to you. Galina couldn't stand to listen to another word, and shut the radio off. Her parents looked up at her with concern, but made no attempt to turn the radio back on. There was no need. It was simple to figure out what the rest of the show would consist of now and for the rest of its existence. They, like their daughter, were horrified at the revelation. However, they were but ordinary people. They were no more powerful in this country than ants under a boot. There was to be a future for all ordinary people, it seemed now, just as it had been in the past, to be trampled on by the boots of tyrants forever. The Vaz killed the radio star. Huh. Yeah. TV killed the radio star. Cool. And yeah, we'll drink all the people. And just deal with the rival faction, so. I do want to do both sides. I don't know if I'm going to go back to the, like, very beginning of Magadan and then go from there. I think we'll just go from, like, you know, from the Siberian National Republic and go from that direction, so. We'll see. During all the people. Form the Re Recovery Commission? Probably do that. Although, <clears throat> oh, if you want to about better industrial expertise, please go right ahead. Although our economy has done exceptionally well in the recent years as we secure agricultural production and trade ports, there is still a great deal of damage left to be repaired from the heavy fighting of recent years. In order to assist in the reconstruction efforts, the new recovery committee has been formed. The committee will oversee all local and national recovery projects currently underway and begin coordinating the flow of government resources into said projects. Hopefully this coordination will cut down recovery times and more efficiently allocate supplies to those that need them. Cool. Alright, get some more of that too. Eh, that's kind of okay for now. Um, agriculture, yes. We, don't have a, we won't have a ton of political power, but it's fine. Go also. I think we'll be fine without needing to look at that. Um, this stuff can wait. We want poverty stuff. Still looking okay here. Oh, eh, lost in a billion, which is nice. Nothing there yet. During the will of the people, nice. Just keep building. When they got build, 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 build. Fascist goon Finland. Oh, how do we know when it's gonna flip? Like sometimes it goes fascist, sometimes it goes communist, sometimes it just goes, just gives up on life. Poverty, yeah. We do the poverty one, and then hiring foreign instructors, and then we want also to do. Actually, that's not bad either. Equipment would be and a military factory. That's pretty nice. The enduring will of the people. Nice. What about six three every day? Um, a sit plan of our own. That's not bad. It's not bad. Not bad. More cities are nice. Eh, it seems okay. Light the peasants. Uplift the peasants. Oh yeah, this is really good stuff. And poor machinery. Ooh, I do not want those max factories though. Free trade. This looks pretty good. Lesson for the solidarists. Uh, let's do this one. Up with the peasants. Among those who suffered the greatest from the collapse of the Soviet Union, it can be argued that the peasantry has had it the worst. Not only were they roughly jerked around as hostile nations traded blows over their lands, but they also witnessed helplessly as the bombings, fighting, and raids saw their farms get destroyed. Under our government, this will be no more. The peasantry of this nation will be subsidized for their troubles in order to aid them in repairing their homes and livelihoods. This subsidization program will include funding for new agricultural equipment and methods, which will hopefully allow them to produce previous records by leaps and bounds. Well, we can only hope. Oh, we can see the traders now too, huh? The tolling of the bell. Petlin sat metaphorically and physically, on the edge of a seat in a leather armchair in his study. He'd already heard the door slam and the engines roaring like hellhounds off to drag him down to his final judgment. Ooh, look at that. Oh, good job, America. Um, and the boots of soldiers slamming the ground as they made their way up his driveway. He knew what they were coming for. He had, he had weeks. He had for weeks. Between the ominous looks from his laborists, his allies disappearing, and the vase stranglehold over, growing ever tighter, Petlin knew a reckoning was coming. The death of any hope of freedom in Magadan was at hand, yet despite how much he had prepared himself mentally, the vent still shook the man to his core. Petlin heard downstairs, his door coming off its hinges unceremoniously as Mikowski's slug stormed his home. He stood up, waiting to th 
awaiting the three-armed men rushing up the staircase into the study. As he raised his hands in a gesture of surrender, suddenly his breath was stolen from him as a prime for combat soldier at the front tackled him at the waist, dizzy and in pain. Bethlehem was rolled up back onto, onto his back, and the shackles were snapped onto his wrist as his charges were read out loud. Treason, an unbelievable charge, an expected charge. I was still stung to hear that all of his efforts to improve the country had earned him the title of traitor. The traitor was dragged out into the street. His neighbors stayed indoors as to not incur the wrath of the Vaz. Instead, they watched through their blinds as Petlin was thrown into the back of an unmarked truck and sped off down the street, never to return to his place. this place. Through his blistering headache, Petlin had only one thought. God save us all. Hey, better still pocket something, though. Nice. That's the only thing I'm concerned about. Uh, resources. I, I want to do all these again. Actually, that's not bad. Revitalize national pro service programs. Pretty nice. Construction. Um, honestly, like I like that one a lot. That's really good for consumer goods. I like infrastructure. But this does use quite a few cities. And they should get quite a rapidly improved military factors. But you get more industrial equipment. So that's the one I want. A lesson learned. Like Kofke said in his office, reading the documents and listing all members of the reformist wing of the RNLP. He crossed another off the list as a phone, came, phone call rang in, mentioning another name. One more eliminated, 20 to go. He cursed himself for underestimating Petlin. That backstabber nearly brought the Vaz downfall. Luckily, the fool didn't have enough support for his idiotic coup. Still, it was devastating to Medkowski to know that someone he trusted, someone he thought of as nearly as a friend, would go all that length just to see Medkowski fall. Were there more Petlins waiting in the dark for the chance of power? Were his other advisors planning to take him down? Mikowski shuddered. He never felt so weak and undermined. He had to be more cautious. Choosing those who would replace the people he had purged would, would be a hard job. Still, this was a lesson to be learned for the future. He would never give away his power. No one could be trusted, and most of all, he would never agree to sign off of reforms that would weaken his leadership ever again. Only he, the Vaz, could bring Russia to greatness. Only he could succeed in the crusade against the traitors and the Germans. Long live the Vaz. And we're going to do this one to get more political power immediately. The armed wing of the former Russian fascist party served the nation well in the past, marching from victory to victory all across the Far East. That being said, it has become increasingly clear that this force of armed thugs and vagabonds simply won't do if we continue the campaign to reclaim Russia. While we have no shortage of eager fighting men, the Siberian National Republic still has no official organized military to speak of. Let us show me that before it gets too late. The green light has been given for the reformation of our young republic's official ground forces the National Republican Army. The NRA is envisioned as a well-capable, a well-equipped, and professional modern force, capable of facing any kind of potential battlefield scenario. Building such a force will take effort, but any price is worth paying for an army worthy to serve in Russia's name. Nice. And apologies for speaking quickly. I'm just excited for this campaign. And I'll be honest, I can't say that about every campaign, but this one I, I like. I like this a lot. Um, improved relations, we're still pretty good, still. Um, honestly, getting better consumer goods right now seems like really important, but... <sighs> equipment. Probably equipment. I like this one too, though. Go GDP. Or mechanic. Or, uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we're on 8.5, that's not bad, but still needs to be better. Up with the peasants, and we'll do that one next. Oh, we get better army professionalism, though. Oh! Oh, as much as I want to do this stuff, yeah, we'll probably go modernize officer corps after uh, the National Republican Armed Forces. <coughs> the National Republican Army still does not have a proper officer corps force. How are the troops of the Republic supposed to go into battle without skilled leaders to guide them? Our current pool of officers won't exactly be easy to work with. Most of them are glorified gang bosses with cliques of loyal button men surrounding them like a sycophantic tick of eyes. Professional officers will be made of those who are too heavily consumed by the abyss of corruption, and promising new recruits will supplement those who are. Talented officers will form the bedrock of a professional army, and encouraging strong leadership in the military would be go great lengths in ensuring that the NRA becomes more than just a ragtag band of brigands. Nice. Even more political power. We demand more power here. And we will improve our... We have 22 divisions now, look at that. Um, economy eventually, and are just like military factories and stuff, but it's going to take some time. Cool. Anything else over here? Um, it's not bad. Combat schooling. Oh, that's, oh, that's so good to do too. Getting some immediate millies would help out. Yeah, the Baratia military complex. The region of Baratia is home to the most developed military production facilities in the Russian Far East. The armaments production centers in this in particular will be a great help to the cause, but upon further inspection, it is obvious that they have seen much better days. Turn apart in the midst of the Bolshevik mutinies and further damaged during our invasion of the region, they will need some serious attention to, being, to bring them back online. On top of the renovations, a comprehensive expansion of the facilities is planned. The capabilities of the Baratia military complex will far surpass what it was able to achieve during the Bolshevik era. It will become the nucleus of the National Republic's military industry, terroristly churning out vast quantities of war material for the army. Good. And I can't do this one yet because it has to be 60... what? 9? Yeah, nice. nice. we got quite a few years for that one. Um... Cool. Trucks... Ah, uh, it's only 25. That's not bad. Hmm... I'll do it anyways, why not? 
Medals of Dishonor. Yuri Vidvitsky uh, sat uh, on a hill overlooking the bustling port of Magadan and reflected on how much his life had changed on the decision he had made earlier that morning. He had, in his older age, decided to fight for Russia, for the idea that his homeland could one day be made whole again, but this has not always been the case. He had, in the past, served a di very different master indeed, one that now opposed in he opposed in every sense of the word. <clears throat> The Empire of Japan had once promised much, and he had not had the experience, the knowledge, or now realized, the desire to see the insidious purpose in everything they did. It had taken him a long time not only to understand that, but also to accept it. To accept how misled, misled he had been, and truth how he had not wanted to see. Reaching into his jacket, he withdrew a small container, and opened it to inspect the contents, medals, the rewards of long and commendable service to an empire that did not, had not ever truly had any respect for him. He had been a tool, but no longer. With one last sort of confirmation, Yuri drew his arm back and threw the container as hard as he could, watching as it tumbled over and over ended and over end, and finally stuck in the water. Sinking below the surface beyond that spot, he could see a large cargo ship moving towards the pier, no doubt carrying material for the state's reunification efforts. The contrast to Yuri was striking. He had a new master, one he could believe in, one who could show his old one the foolishness of the goals. There were new medals to be earned. And let's go with uh, important machinery. The state of industry in Russia is rather poor. Not only is it most of its decades old, left over from former Soviet Union and its industrial project, but their practice is falling apart after so many years of use. Not only that, but our old and inefficient equipment is making our products more expensive and less competitive. If we want to revitalize Russia's manufacturing sector and go and make our exports more attractive, we're going to need to bring our equipment up to the standards of the rest of the world. We have several business contacts in the U.S. who have indicated that they would be more than glad to provide us with the top-notch equipment for the right price. All right, so we're a little bit ahead of time. I just figured that, you know what? We were all, we were already here in industrial equipment, and we had ten and a half every month. <clears throat> so I'm thinking, if we were to rush this and get rapidly improve industrial equipment some more, we might as well just wait, and we'll get this one in like a month or two. So might as well just wait to do this one. So instead, we've done uplift the peasants, of course, but establish the Transbaikal State University. The Transbaikal State University has the potential to be one of the largest universities in our nation. Originally built by the USSR during its mad run of construction projects before the collapse, the university was to have several schools, among them which was school mining, law. Economics, construction, ecology, and more. Given the large physical size and relative well-preserved buildings, it wouldn't be too building difficult to set up a staff and integrate the new school system into our tertiary educational system, research and development facilities. As Russia has learned time and time again, staying on top of modern technologies is of vital importance today. Not only is it important to be up-to-date in modern military technology, without which we would be crushed in a war with any of our more modern neighbors, but also in an economic sense. New production techniques and technologies are being innovated all the time, and if we want our products to become more competitive on the global markets, we'll need to innovate and adopt them. As such, investments into the new research and development facilities are a logical destination for government funds. Fund the Corps of Engineers, with a rate of which our nation is expanding economically. We will soon need more engineers and edu oh, look at this one. Uh, education, educated construction workers than we currently have access to. In order to alleviate or map our issues, we will fund the creation of the Russian Corps of Engineers. Much like its American counterpart, the Corps will provide construction services and assist in engineering projects across the nation. Additionally, our Corps of Engineers will provide free training and education to enlistees, provided they work for the Corps for four years after. <clears throat> and we're going to need, yeah, just go and grab this stuff, that's fine. A sip plan of our own. Bukharin's Siberian plan was an aggressive and ambitious last ditch effort to industrialize the Soviet Union, far beyond the front lines in order to combat Germany. The plan made significant progress in the short time it was being developed before Bukharin was removed from power, and continues to be the foundation of the Siberian economy even today. We should seek to emulate such success. The plans are no secret in the Soviet Union, as given the vast amount of resources and manpower it demanded. Factory managers and administrators all over the former Union still have knowledge of this plan, and our administration has even found some documents and schematics that have been kept hidden away for all these years. We can turn these plans and schematics into a Siberian plan of our own, a Far Eastern plan, perhaps. Import machinery, of course, finally. So it's, it was more worthwhile to wait to do this. So it's still going up by 2.62 2 every day, which is pretty good. <clears throat> Maintain the railway. The Trans-Siberian Railway is one of the most important pieces of infrastructure in the nation. It's our sole infrastructural connection to the rest of Russia. It must be maintained. Currently, much of the railway is in shambles after being bombed and fought over for several years. Fortunately, no militaries in the Far East were so foolish as to allow harm to come to the vital link to inner Russia. Our job now is to simply maintain it and keep it in good shape for military transport, commerce, and whatever else we may need of it. The labor's due? Mm, we're going to wait. Uh, the Industrial Recovery Act. The free market is great for quickly industrializing and bringing wealth to the region, but there typically needs to be infrastructure in place before such investments really start pouring in. To that end, the Industrial Recovery Act will invest several millions of dollars into improving old factories and building new ones with the goal of incentivizing foreign corporations to set down roots in the Far Eastern Republic. If you can provide all construction materials, raw materials, and transportation infrastructure to start making a factory you hear cheap and easy, investors will come and invest. Yeah, get some more industry, that'd be good. <clears throat> and I apologize for my coughing. Oh my goodness. I'm such a coffer. Oh boy. 1.2 billion, Soviet. 
And the labor is due for enterprise. Uh, mining. Eh. Made in Russia. That's not bad. Labor is due. Screw it. Factories in our country can run day and night providing materials and goods for the greedy capitalists and corporatists of our nation. Day after day, our citizens' labor are crushed by the massive workloads that are given each and every day. Even then, after long days of work and a short night's rest, they get the bare minimum a company is willing to shell out for their pay sometimes, not even more than a few cents on the dollar an hour. It is an angering thing, working so hard for so little, and the lower class seems to agree. If we're not careful, they may even fall under the influence of some charismatic populist or communist offering salvation in their ideologies. If we want to prevent that from happening and improve the stability of our nation, we should work towards improving the laborer's lot in life, starting with his pay. And now we're out of uh, blah, 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 manpower. Oh, words are hard. Now, as much as I want to do free enterprise, um, this seems like free trade seems more like a reformist thing, so if you want to do that, read that, please go ahead. We'll go do lessons from the solidarists. Uh, the economy can be a fickle thing. The stock market's up one day and falling another. It's difficult to pin why anything happens in the economy these days, fortunately. National security and defense is not so difficult. Instead of playing around with things called trade laws and border policies, we should instead be investing government time and effort into building up our military industry in order to protect ourselves from the potential attacks from our neighbors in the West. <clears throat> the economy should be left to those corporate heads to figure out. Nice. Artillery and trucks still? Ah, artillery's okay. Trucks are okay as well. Huh. Not bad. I'll grab some of that too, and then grab the lessons from the Solidarists. Nice. <clears throat> Very nice. Made in Russia. Our efforts to revitalize the economy and build up our manufacturing sector are paying off. Production of goods have been steadily increasing across the last two quarters, and we've witnessed record investment, both internally and externally, but into the nation's economy as businesses have begun moving in. Our estimates for the manufacturing sector show that signs for the next year's growth rate may dwarf this year's growth rate by a factor of two. National, the National Republic is well on its way to becoming a developed, industrialized nation. As it should be. Mm, I kind of want to save our political power maybe a little more. Or increase our relations as well. Because we definitely need to do that. Uh, what we're going to do is do this though. Put you off. Because we need some planes. We could really use some planes. Um, fighters? Yes please. Maybe a little bit more casts? Yes please. There you go. Train. Oh, you're all together. Um, 400, 200, uh, 200. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, keep them separate for now. It's fine. Made in Russia. <clears throat> the Homestead Act. Much of our lands are sparsely populated despite modern technology allowing for significantly more agriculture and construction to be done in these regions. Our Homestead Act will seek to alleviate this by incentivizing our people to abandon those cities and make out there, in the wild, free lands of the north. Not only will we be offering free government land, but will additionally further support farmers and homesteaders by offering government supplies sort of pluses for the use at the heightened, at heightened discounts, mostly in the way of construction materials. Should all go well, we will see a further utilization of previously unproductive land sparking a population boom. Well, that's the hope. How close is agriculture? Oh, we're on mass mechanization already. Um, honestly, we probably don't need to really invest in that too much. So, or nearly as, as much. Yeah, the Americans love us. It's still very high support. Industry, absolutely. Uh, yeah. We do what we must. And build up more civvies. Nice. And there goes the Boer Republic. Very cool. Made in Russia. Homestead Act. Followed up with expanding mining operations. The Far East is the land of great mineral riches if one is able to extract them. Mining companies in our lands extract hundreds of thousands of tons of gold, nickel, coal, iron, and chromium every year. And we expect that there could be we could extract several times more than that with the right investment of capital and manpower. Not only would such additional resources, production, vastly benefit our economy, but our military industry would prosper as well. There are a variety of rare and valuable minerals that we find ourselves in constant need of when producing weapons or similar military equipment. And trading internationally for such resources can be a great national security risk, one we will hopefully avoid by increasing resource production domestically. Nice. Even more already. Poverty relief, yes. Yes. And then hiring foreign instructors too. Yes, 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 yes. 1.1 billion, not bad. How is poverty doing right now? Eh, it's going up okay-ish. And from the ashes, the National Republic rises in a new, as a phoenix from the ashes. With great investment of capital, time, and energy into the economy, we've managed to sow the seeds of a prosperous economy. Investments into our manufacturing sector, education system, technology development, and the resource extraction industry have yielded massive returns as growth in each industry compounded development in all of them. Our National Republic <coughs> is well on its way to becoming an economic powerhouse, and soon becoming Russia as well. Nice. All very good stuff. All very, 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 very good stuff here. Yes, please. More foreign instructors, please. Nice. Oh, look at that. That's pretty good, too. A billion? Awesome. 
2020? Oh, that's so good. That is so good. 2020 was not a good year, but nice. Uh, tactical refinement. Opportunities abroad. Now that we've cemented our position in the Far East, it's time for us to pursue opportunities abroad and look for any foreign support that we can garner, unfortunately. The actions of our former rivals to the South means that most of the natural and closest allies of convenience, Japan, won't even bother assisting us. This means that we'll have to look further east, across the Pacific, the U.S. of A. The world's preeminent economic power, the U.S., would surely assist us if we promised to further the token reform that the Vaz pushed through for a reunification of the Far East. Hmm... Yeah, I'll do that one. Machinery. Heavy machinery. Keep building, keep building, 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 building. 8.6 is not bad. 1.81, 1.18 billion is quite a bit, but whatever. It's fine, it's fine. Also, we're trying to make some tank divisions, too. Tactical refinement. The current unit tactics of the Siberian National Republic's armed forces are mostly unchanged from the days of the Russian Fascist Party. While they work well enough and allow for total control over the East Far Eastern regions, perhaps it would be wise to move on to a more... Int uh, intelligent tactic than just running and shouting at the enemy with guns blazing. Past guns or past battles have proved that. While this approach is quite heroic in theory, in practice it is usually results in more casualties than necessary. The newly established high command of the NRA suggests a shift towards more conventional squad tactics to minimize casualties while simultaneously improving your unit's performance on the field. Nice. Not bad. Only have 30 some odd divisions. Where are these guys too, which are 20 combat, which are, they're okay. Got some engineers, got some support artillery. Pretty pretty normal stuff to grab. The National Republic and the world. Prepare for the National Republic a Diplomatic Corps. Preface. The National Republic has achieved unquestioned control of Eastern Siberia and will, in short order, establish control over the entire national territory. This report, see attached, will present a comprehensive breakdowns of diplomatic opportunities that can or may be exploited by the National Republic for gain, economic or otherwise, in pursuit of this goal. Regional summaries follow. Asia, primary prospects involve the support or sponsorship of anti-Japanese organizations in Manchuria and elsewhere. Interference, Japanese aligned interests considered highly likely. North America, primary outreach likely towards the U.S., leveraging previous connections established by the state, potential gains substantial. Secondary targets include Canada and Mexico. South America, prospect remains limited at the current time. Europe, prospects remain limited at the current time as a result of overwhelming German influence. Africa, people remain limited, prospects remain limited at the current time. Oceania, Australia and New Zealand considered highly likely prospects, owing to shared interests regarding Japanese influence, outreach, and courage. B.A. Karamov, Senior Class Officer, State Intelligence. Opportunities abound. We only must pursue them. Anything upon here? Uh, eh, seems okay. City Foreign Designs. Ah, oh, praise the valiant, valiant Sorodniki. Just when all hope seemed lost for Russia's future, and the former bastion of anti-Bolshevism was torn to shreds by conflict, the Vals and his noble Soratniki miraculously turned the tables on the eastern warlords and brought the entire region under one flag. The wars were brutal and inhumane beyond reason, but her brave boys pulled through and claimed victory even when the situation appeared hopeless. Truly, this is one of the, for the history books, a fine ray of hope in this dark chapter of Russian history. The struggle is not yet over, however, and our heroes need all the help they can get when the time comes to bring all of Russia together again. The forces who oppose us are stronger than ever, and it will take all the strength we have to bring them to their knees. Brave men of the East, we, we hereby call upon you to join our cause. Join in the National Republican Army, and together we shall march one more, once more into legend. Nice. You know what? I'm going to grab some of this, too, because I love that soft attack. I'm going to get it really good. Um... We buy more stuff here. I want to wait to buy more American stuff. Yeah, equipment, military factory. It's nice. It's pretty nice. Tactical refinement. Nice. Awesome. Just awesome. What are we missing now? Guns? How are we missing guns? I guess I guess we didn't really invest too many in guns, which sucks, but whatever. Yeah, we really didn't invest. Matthias, overthrown, cool. Yeah, we don't we don't have that many guns. Holy crap, yeah. Um, China modernizes. Good job, China. Where are we at for agriculture? Yeah, just it's not really worth it compared to everything else right now. Go with education. Uh, this one this gives more army professionals every month. New training methods. Currently, our soldiers would be charitably described as an undisciplined gang of thugs, given the minimum level of training necessary, and pushed out into the field without installing any real sense of professionalism. Much of the army consists of rabid dogs prone to committing wholly preventable acts of collateral damage while at the same time, being luckily to turn tail the first sign of danger. If you want to read about Ayers of Babylon, please go right ahead. Rigorous training regimens will be the key to fighting... Uh, turning this lawless rabble into a proper fighting force. The U.S., a close partner of our regime, is one of the finest militaries on the planet at their disposal. The troops' level of discipline is second to none, and we can only dream of building an army of the same kind of quality. The first step on that long road lies in overhauling the methods used to turn young men into soldiers, and we should look to the American system for inspiration. As we should. 
Sign up and fall in. Young Sergey rubbed his eyes as he walked to the sound of the loudspeaker outside the window. Outside, a truck drove by and a voice blared from his mount mounted loudspeaker. Surat Niki, your advice is calling you to a higher purpose. Though you may not have helped vanquish the false heirs of Habin, you now have the opportunity to achieve a far greater glory. The reunification of our Russian land. <clears throat> Our friends in America have sent you the finest arms and equipment, but now we need you. Sergei pondered these words as he went downstairs to eat his breakfast. His parents had made him a simple kasha, and as he ate, he could hear the truck driving by again. Our victory over the traitors, subversives, and lunatics is the first step towards a triumph over the Hun. With your help, we shall celebrate New Year's in Moscow. With your help, we shall celebrate Christmas in Kiev. And with your help, the world will stand in awe of Russia's majesty once more. Unless with the National Republican Army today, and our motherland will be united tomorrow. Sergei knew his parents wouldn't approve, but after his breakfast, he hurried to the city hall to find the local recruiter. His parents would just have to miss his 18th birthday this year. To arms for Russia! Nice. And stock the armories. The only thing just as important as manpower is the guns they use. The plans for the establishment of the National Republican Army call for a massive increase of the total size of the armed forces, and right now our weapons production facilities are woefully inadequate to meet the potential demands. We'll just have to make do with what we have. Our fledging armaments industry shall work around the clock to fill the armaments with high-quality, modern weapons for new recruits to use. If we can find ways to streamline the methods of weapons production, there will be no hesitation implementing them in the assembly lines. There must be a fully loaded rifle in the hands of every single soldier. Absolutely. Wow, we're doing a lot better than this. Holy crap. Um... Infrastructure is nice and all, but go consumer goods. Look at this. Good. Build, 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 build. Still very high. Awesome. Stock the armories. Oh, we do with some more here. Infrastructure is not really worth doing infrastructure. But you do get production of oil, chromium. Yeah, I'll do that one. Which is actually pretty good for resources. City Foreign Designs. The state of the National Republican Army's equipment is, frankly, completely unacceptable. Bold action rifles and submachine guns might have been used at the forefront of military ingenuity half a century ago, but they're simply too ancient by the standards of today. The fact is we need better guns and lots of them. Ideally, it's standardized with all the modern bells and whistles would serve our purposes perfectly, but how to decide upon designs? Though, through our ties with the U.S., we could examine those of which are currently in use with the U.S. military. From fully automatic assault rifles, firing intermediate cartridges, to man portable tank killers, the American arsenal is formidable indeed. We shall send experts from our R&D department on a field trip to the U.S. with the aim of studying their weapons and finding ways to adapt them for our own forces. Nice. Yeah, we can do this up, but we don't really need to. And happy 68, everybody. I didn't mention that earlier, but it is 68 now, which is nice. Um, anything else? Nope. Cool. Project Zemnyi. The National Republican Army currently has no mechanized element to speak of. Even motorized equipment is a rare sight among the troops, and most have to make do with horses or specialized sleds. Meanwhile, in the rest of the world, mechanized forces have become the standard. In the process of modernizing, mechanization is simply non-negotiable. We need IFBs and we need tanks. The R&D project or development or department has begun an initiative fancifully called Project Zimye, Zimye, a research project tasked with developing modern fighting vehicles for the armed forces. Among the highest priorities are armored personnel carriers and main battle tanks, the bread and butter of any proper modern military. Our brave troops screaming across the battlefield in mobile carriers armed to the teeth with cannons and missiles is quite the spectacular image, and with a little effort it could become a reality as well. Time that pretty, pretty nicely, actually. Good. We like them heavy. At least get at least one, one going for now. Uh, go three. Go down by one for now. It's fine. We need more guns still, probably. We just don't have the industry. Yeah, we need we need way more guns. Um, you know what? Buy, buy more guns. It's only a thousand, but whatever. Reorganize the branches. The organization of the National Republican Army is coming along well and is rapidly becoming the modern force that was op optimistically envisioned several months ago. That being said, the NRA cannot possibly hope to achieve anything at once, or everything at once. An Air Force to support our ground troops is badly needed, and it is imperative that we begin to assemble separate military branches to serve this in this regard. To make matters worse, we have no actual fleet to guard the critical port of Magadan. The ships we do have could hardly be considered military vessels, being more intended for fishing than conducting war on the high seas. Before we can begin efforts to construct a fleet worthy of a newly revitalized Russia, a separate naval arm must be created. Nice. What do we have here? Anything else? Yes, yes, just now. Um, electronics, yeah, go into that one. That's fine. The National Republican Navy. Despite a stronghold of Magadan being the most vital port in Russia still under control of the Russians, our Republic still has no real navy to speak of. We have a few ships capable of undertaking military duties in the port of Magadan, but they are unorganized and not entirely ready to be sent out of the sea. This changes today. The National Republican Navy will be established to stand guard over Russia's waters, 
and the few existing ships of Magadan will be reorganized into proper fleets commanded by the few capable admirals we have at our disposal. To accomplish a further expansion of the new navy, the port of Magadan must be expanded far beyond its previous capabilities, although it will never match the facilities of former Vladivostok. Magadan could use, or perhaps become the next best thing. I do want to encourage construction. This doesn't even help us with GDP, so... Oh, and Africa has died. Yay! The horror. Well, only if you think it's if it's a horror. Liberal victory in Canada. Cool. Oh, look at this. Open Cheetah Military Academy. Say what you will about the Tsars, but they had a fine cabal of officers at their disposal. Many of these sharp military minds now serve in our military, and it suggested the construction of a new military academy for the purpose of training the NRA's next line of officers. The existing high command has been quite receptive to this idea, and a suitable venue of Cheetah has already been decided upon to be renovated into what will become the Cheetah Military Academy. This is where eager young recruits will be sharpened and shaped into proper commissioned officers, we relieve leave commanding our troops and leading them to victory. With a healthy supply of new officers graduating from the academy, the soldiers of the National Republic can rest assured that only the finest military minds shall guide them into the fray. We can accept nothing less for the valiant army that is expected to make Russia whole once again. Anything for the industry and economy. Hmm... Salvage a fleet, might as well. When the Vala's forces captured the naval bases of Kamchatka, they expected to find formidable Red Navy war vessels in near pristine condition. What they found instead were retrofitted scrap heaps and rusty old tubes that could hardly be described as seaworthy. Now we have a fleet of useless scrap heaps sitting in, uh, in the Petropavlovsk, Kamchatsky accomplishing nothing else besides being a major eyesore. Surely we could find a use for them. Our trade fleet needs ships, and some of these old vessels could serve that purpose handily. All they would need is some salvage work, and we could potentially get them sailing again. As for the glorified rust buckets that cannot be useful to us in any possible scenario, we could always just sell them off or break them down for scrap. One man's trash is another's treasure after all. Nice. Do we actually have... Eh, we're, get, we're doing better on guns now. Nice. Actually, since we're here, I forgot about these guys, too. Salvage the fleet, please. Thank you very much. And the National Republican Air Force. It is foolish... It is a foolish man who assumes that the wars are only fought one on the ground. Our new military is badly exposed without a strong air force to support them, and it is this fact that has led to the formation of the National Republican Air Force. Um, like their ground-based counterparts, NRAF is envisioned as a fully modernized air force equipped with some of the finest aircrafts in the world. These dreams are still a ways off due to our present scenario, but the foundations of a proper air component of the military is a good first step. The R&D department is already hard at work examining the latest foreign designs to adapt to in some form of our new air fleet, and the results are promising indeed. Time to claim the skies for Russia. Actually, so for here, jet engines are nice. We are literally a modern agriculture, so we're done with that. We have modern research facilities too, which is pretty cool. So any agricultural stuff we are finished and finito with. Thank you. Come again. Okay, is this glitch? Why is it still very high? But the musings of a sailor. The Shukas were old boats, once built as undersea killers. Few had been used for their intended role. The Reds and Petropavlovsk had converted many for smuggling large sections of torpedo rooms stripped of their cylindrical warheads, replaced with cargo holds and additional accommodation. Now in the hands of the Siberian National Republic, the process was completed, the last vestiges of their warfighting capability having been stripped from their holes. Albermov looked over the half-dozen or so vessels now tied up at the Magadan's port, the gray blue-gray blue waters of the Sea of Okhotsk, lapping at their holes. He checked over the manifest. Most of the vessels would be assigned to smuggling from Petropavlovsk or Magadan to Alaska, providing the Republic with a steady stream of income and hard currency. Some of the older vessels will be laid up their holes like a source of spares for the rest of the fleet, and one would be used as a training ship, educating a new generation of submariners in the art of surviving under the sea. Taking a glance at the setting sun, Abramov walked back to his new office, pouring himself a mug of coffee. He let his mind drift back to the meetings in Manchuria, the reclamation of the Far East, and the breakup of the Haven Three. Times were simpler back then when they had Yugoda's supreme Soviet keeping everyone on the same page, but the differences and the disagreements eventually grew too deep to over paper. Or to paper over. He was amazed he'd managed to survive the cutthroat politicking long enough to throw his lot in with Mikoski. Noticing his mug was empty, Abramov moved to refill it. He had enough rem enough reminiscing for one day if there was work to do. The right choice, one would of course think. Cool. Expand the airfields. The National Republican Air Force grows by the day, but it lacks proper air base to conduct missions de from. We could just build some new airfields, but that would take far too much effort that would be better spent elsewhere. Besides, what use would building an ad hoc landing strip in the middle of nowhere be when we have perf perfectly good facilities available for us for now? There are several air bases previously controlled by the Tsars and Bolsheviks that have gone unused since our conquest of the region. As such, these airfields are to be repaired and expanded to house an even greater capacity of aircraft than before. With time, they will continue to be the nerve centers of the NRAF, the proverbial springboard from which all of their missions into the West will be, of course, launched.
Oh, look at that. Guess what we have? A tank. It's not great. It's only 20 combo. But hey, it's still a tank we can use. I want lots of attack from these guys. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of attack. No Panzer leaders, which makes sense, but still. With a song to victory. Actually, uh, this is coming back online, so it's, it's good to see, so we'll do that one. <laughs> Looking upon the Star Wars Band of Brothers, to think, not long ago, it was a much more, not much more than a disorganized rabble hardly fit to call themselves a gang of bandits, let alone an army. The establishment of the National Republican Army has exceeded our wildest expectations, and a fully modernized professional military now awaits our command. No doubt, our neighbors to the west will grow rather nervous once they catch sight of our newly reorganized forces. Perhaps it's time to put our theories into practice. The National Republican Army stands ready. The National Republican Navy has set their eyes to the sea, and the National Republican Air Force is prepared to unleash heck from above. At last, we can finally claim to be ready to continue the reunification of Russia. The moment to strike west rapidly approaches, and our commanders are confident that victory is all but assured. Prepare yourselves, brave Soroniki of the Republic's armed forces for... Your greatest challenge, of course, awaits. Yes, industry, yes. Nice. Great. Uh, connections with the Dysphoria. With the legacy of the Von Tsiatsky support and the lack of any other real alternatives, we can claim to the emigres of the Russian Dysphoria that we're the best bet to ensure that Russia forged in a strong anti-communist vision will lead the Russian people into a new era. Would he be taking advantage of the connections to the diaspora that Von Syatsky left for us, alongside his already generous donations to ensure that the Russian emigre communities and America and across the globe will be willing to not only donate to our cause, but also come back to the nation and give us the expertise and education that many of them possess? As we're going to sp keep spending, keep spending, keep spending, it's fine. Spend, spend, spend as much as you need to to make sure that we do okay here. Like, we, we got to make sure we do okay. Have we built up all the cities already? No, we've not. Lies, lies by the economists. We have more room to grow. Well, a little bit more room. Maybe not that much more room, but a little bit more room. Poverty relief, yes. A free haven. Come back, brave Russian. Come back to the National Republic and help us spearhead the extension of our authority westwards for the good of yourself and the good of all Russians. It's time to posture our state through a series of international propaganda offensives as one of the most interested in reviving the traditional values so beloved by the emigres, but also the one that is considered a free haven for the Russian people, a combination that will create the true National Republic, both free and focused on the Russian people. By doing this, we will not only better assuage the fears of reluctant American leaders and better gear them towards assisting us, but also attract more emigres to come to our capital and begin working with us towards national reunification. Our GDP growth will increase slightly as a result of national returning people. Nice. Well, that's exactly what we would like to see. Still very high? Nice. Come home to the city upon a hill. Today, Mikhail Mikoski uh, has made a very public announcement over the radio that he will be personally traveling to the infamous city upon a hill, Washington, D.C., to the lobby for the support of the United States and our allies in the Organization of Free Nations. He has mentioned that they will intend on meeting with the highest officials possible. The president, if given the chance, in order to request an official trade deal between the U.S. and the National Republic. This deal, I've made official, will do wonders for our republic. Not only would it bring in a lot of much-needed funding, but it also indirectly show the role that the U.S. supports us and only us. They still support us very highly, so. And sponsor the Russian Liberation Front. When the Japanese chose to support the mad batting king and the decrepit Tsarist instead of us, it shut a lot of doors in our proverbial face. This, however, is far from a bad thing. It awoke, uh, awoke our leadership up to the reality that the Japanese have no interest in a strong Russian state, only a vested ec economic interest in exploiting Siberia for everything that it's got. On top of this, the Japanese occupied rival Russian land that they call Manchuria. Luckily, they barely keep an even tentative control over the area, and have allowed the Russian Liberation Front to continue to operate through what can only be ineptness on their part. We should support... These part partisans with funding and material aid ensure that they will continue to fight to operate, harassing the Japanese and fighting for the return of our stolen territories from the south bank of the Moor to Vladivostok to our rifle control. Homecoming. At first, it was barely noticeable. Just a few scared, uh, scared and hopeless fa hopeful faces mixed among the crowd doc crowded docks and airports of Siberia. Every week, a few more of those faces would arrive, presenting their passports and documents to custom workers, who would weigh them through an ex expedited arrival process. At first, it was barely a trickle, but soon that trickle had grown into a stream, and the stream into a flood of new immigrants arriving in Magadan, Kamchatka, and, of course, Irkutsk. For most of these new arrivals, this is an opportunity they have waited for decades for, a chance to return to the homeland that was stolen from them decades ago. For others, it was a chance to start over, to build a new life in a new nation where their past is only as important as they choose it to be. For a few, it is a chance to see the motherland they grew up hearing stories of, but never dared to visit them. With the warlords vanquished and order restored into the east, they can finally see the nations and their families love so dearly. 
With the number of immigrants increasing by the day, more customs agents have been hired in the visa application. Process has been streamlined to reduce uh, delaying arrivals and integration as much as possible. All across uh, the globe, the children of Mother Russia have heard the wonderful news. The nation is rebuilding, and the time for all Russians to do the duty has come at last. Every day, more people arrive at our shores to answer the call to action and to build a new life, or even retake an old one. Russia is not yet lost and prepared for war because we have to literally just go to war with these guys. So, and I don't think these guys are going to try to go kill us off, but. Okay, I'll show it out, my friends. We are getting up and getting ready to, to destroy all enemies of who would not like to see a reunified Russia. Because eventually we're going to do this stuff. Home at last. Is this where you grew up, Papa? No, Sasha. I grew up in Vladivostok. This is Magadan. Is Vladivostok this cold? No, sweetheart. It definitely isn't. and wasn't. Why can't we go there, then? Igor looked out at the airport window across the icy fields and snow blanked buildings. It was miserably cold outside, and the airport's insulation was far from perfect. But he still felt a warmth in his belly. It was the same warmth he felt when he met Sofia after arriving in San Francisco in the ancient year of 1947, or when he first held Sasha in his arms in the hospital in Sacramento. There was some indescribable joy in seeing all the signs and labels written in Russian confirming that he could still read his first language. Even hearing the chatter of all the other people at the airport was an unexpected by joy. An unexpected joy. The familiar words and syllables brought back so many memories of better times before everything had gone south. Papa? Sasha's question snapped Igor back to reality. I'm sorry, sweetheart. What did you say? Why can't we go to Vladivostok instead? Oh, he hesitated for a moment. The Japanese control it. Darn, Sasha replied. Igor could only nod. Welcome back, Igor. Welcome home, Sasha. Every I'll be honest. Every time I say the word Sasha, I'm thinking about this other girl that I know. Like, please. I know it's a typical, like, Russian name, but... <laughs> still. <laughs> still. And then we'll do the, to the city upon the hill and then the guns of the Patriots. Supply weapons to the Russian Liberation Front in Manchuria. Ooh, they lose 30% stability. Wow, that's a huge amount of stability. Nice, that sets us up for very nicely for the uh, Russian war. The Manchurian candidate, though. After one careful look outside to make sure he had not been followed, Alexander closed the door to the isolated rural home he had now found himself in. Taking a deep breath, he turned around and took a seat at the table in the cent center of the room. On the other side of the table sat a representative from the so-called Siberian National Republic, flanked on one either side by not so suitably armored guards. Now then, the representative spoke softly, almost quietly, and Alexander couldn't blame him. When it came to fighting the Japanese, even the walls may have ears. Shall we discuss our aid to you and your compatriots? With a quick nod from Alexander, he continued speaking. We are willing to provide arms, supplies, funding, and training to your rebels. Everything you ask for from us. In exchange, we all ask. All we ask is that upon the liberation of these territories, that we may be joined with our republic. Do you agree to meet that term? Alexander swallowed. He had a little love for Yagoda's clique in Irkutsk, but he did not place much more trust in the squabbling Hobbin exiles. But the Far East unified once again. There had been never more an opportune time to throw a wrench in the Japanese operations of Manchuria. It wasn't like he and the rest of the insurgents had much choice in the matter either. Without outside Ox support, they stood a little chance against a mighty Japanese occupier. So be it. You, you, you yourselves have a deal, Alexander said at last. We shall unite our people. All that remains is a drop off of supplies. Guns of the Patriots. The National Republic is not the only organization struggling against the oppression of Tokyo and her corporate interests. To herself, the Russian Liberation Front has long struggled against the Japanese and the Manchurian puppets. Having worked towards the freeing of our stolen territories for years. Oh, Harrington, look at that. Well, they demotivated. Uh, slip -shod, slipshod Manchurian army comes the serious potential and reality of continuous low-level insurgencies across, against the Japanese puppet government of Manchukuo and the benefactors from Tokyo. While these insurgencies have long been suffering, it's time to help them turn things around. Mikhail Mikoski has requested the shipments of our old order, or older, less necessary weapons and ammo be convertly smuggled into Manchuria for these groups with the hope that they will turn around the gradual, seemingly inevitable slide into defeat against the Japanese. If you'd like to buy better army professionals, then please go ahead. Excellent. Nice. Very good. Equipment, yes. Anything else here? Oh, yeah. The other two. America, they love us. Love it. Uh, education. Yeah. Might as well. We've got the PP4 now, so it's fine. Do the city upon a hill. And which why I want to do that one before we do this one because we need to make sure that this, this, this succeeds or fails, so. Laval's venture. Are you almost done with the preparations? Mikoski hissed at the scurrying pair of aides. Really just RNLP members with nothing better to do than conscripted into the task. Gathering what little luggage Mikoski intended to bring as well some necessary papers. As they quickly apologized and redoubled their efforts. Mikoski hopped and turned back to his desk before him, where he was attempting to complete what work he, what he, could, he could before the trip. It was hard to imagine that by tomorrow he would be in America, a self-declared land of the free and much more importantly, to Metkovsky, a potentially crucial ally against the Japanese dogs. With the aid of the Americans, celebrations might just be held in old great Vladivostok yet, and that alone was reason enough to attempt to form this relationship with Washington. As long as they were of use, Americans could try to push their senseless ideals onto him all they liked if it made him feel better, not that it would do him any good in the end. When at last the things were packed, Mikoski gave in a sigh, putting his pen down and getting up to head to bed. He was too distracted by his thoughts to properly get work done, and he needed to be rested for the meeting. If all went well, Russia would have a very powerful friend in the world, and one who could change everything for her. The dreams of Haben carried to Washington. 
Please, please, be successful, please. Taking a breather. As Mikhail Mikoski sat down in his DC hotel room, he felt aches. He didn't even know he had washed away in a wave. He, they didn't have couches like this at home, even as a boss. It was a struggle to find comfortable furniture. The phone conveniently sat on a table right next to him, and he decided to make use of the amenities. Room service? A short silence. What do you need, Mr. Mikoski? Give me a rum, he thought for a second. Cuban. That'll be right on its way, sir. A few minutes later, he reclined, uh, uh, sipping a drink that had been the stuff of dreams just a few years ago. If Rajeski wasn't dead, he would have loved to have seen his face. His thoughts turned to the day's events. Things had started off poorly. His welcome on the tarmac that morning was marred by the presence of a group of protesters, shouting all sorts of anti-fascist invective. They were lucky they hadn't met him at home. Mid-afternoon, once he had properly settled in, he met with the president for what turned out to be a very productive series of talks, where they discussed a number of topics ranging from the need for cooperation against Japanese aggression to the possibility of expanding economic ties in the future, to questions about his political reform. Mikoski made vague promises about democratization far off into the future, when the internal situation was more stable. The president was a reasonable person and would naturally understand the delicacy of such matters, at least that's what the boss hoped. The dinner was sumptuous, sumptuous, and Mikoski was very much enjoyed playing the part of the dignitary. It was particularly pleased to give a toast to the world without ty tyranny, earning substantial applause from those present. All in all, it had been a good enough showing for the Siberian National Public's return to the world stage. He felt himself drifting out to sleep, and made one final mental note. Find out where he could uh, order a chair like this one for his office at home. A fruitful day, but a busy one. Oh, please, please, please. Come on. Oh, which one? Which one? Oh, let me don't too. Additional reserves. Oh, they reject us. God dang it. News comes out of the U.S. that has dealt a major blow to the Siberian National Republic's efforts to gain recognition abroad as a recent deal brokered by our leadership has been completely rejected by the president. Despite a visit by the by SNR delegation to Washington, D.C., the Americans ultimately decided that closer cooperation was not in their interests, either because of the SNR's history as a deriv derivative of the Russian fascist party, or because they did not see the value of a client in the remote regions of Siberia. With this decision, our future in international affairs becomes substantially murkier. Perhaps Americans could be persuaded to reconsider their offer when the SNR controls more of the Russian landmass, but for now, we must be ready to fight for Russia's future alone. Without a major international patron, our foreign policy has been significantly weakened, with the potentially dire circumstances and consequences. In Magadan, where many people's hopes ride on further connections with the U.S., the mood's grim and many of our diplomats are undoubtedly being chewed out or worse, a setback but not insurmountable, on our own two feet. Mikhail Mikoski has brought somber news back to Magadan with him. His negotiations with Americans have proven to be unsuccessful. Despite some common ground being reached with them, it was not enough to ensure the passage of the so-called Siberian American Trading Act. However, this is far from the death of hope for a nation. A brief radio announcement has been planned by Mikhail Mikowski once they have returned and settled back into the capital. In the meantime, the Vaz has announced a plan of strong national development in lieu of the trading deal it hoped to secure by traveling to Washington. The upgrading of infrastructure, the creation of new jobs, and extending the previous developmental programs they've already put in place. We always have a plan, no matter what. Always have a plan. We're looking really good. Really, really good. On a, a deficit. Yeah, we're doing this just because we can. Guns of the Patriots. I'm gonna get the Sakalin back, that'd be nice. And New Horizons eventually as well. Uh, we did this stuff too, which is very nice, but we gotta keep working on gun stuff. Yeah, we really, really, really need to keep working on gun stuff. Yeah. New Horizons. Regards of the success of our efforts in the U.S., a single trading partner alone does not make a nation. Mikhail Mikowski has requested that his administration reach out across the world for further potential trading partners. Already, our foreign department has made up a list of potential nations who will be willing to engage with us in trade. Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and Mexico are all planned to receive delegations sent from the National Republic. With these new horizons explored, we can expect that further prosperity and international awareness, if not outright recognition, will ensure that the future of the National Republic is secured for the time being. Nice. I forgot about land auction too, so my bad. Here's more max planning, main battle tanks, nice. Early fighters, better fighters, good stuff. Hey, I've got enough guns too now. Which is good to see. Improve academic base. If you're wondering about that, please go ahead. This is going along pretty nicely as well. Um, we're gonna need more. We're gonna need way more tanks. We're, we're gonna need way more tanks. Get more fighters first too. Primary schooling? Great. Resources? So we don't need fuel later on? Probably a smart thing to do. Alternate avenues. Our previous negotiations and talks with Americans have resulted in failure, and their official support goes our chance to stand up to the rest of the world as a legitimate power in Siberian waste. Now, we must retreat to our idyllic dreams of international claim and seek out other resources of wealth to fashion a name for ourselves, whether it's scrounging up what we can from pillaged resources of our neighbors and increase the appeal of illegal shipping to the port of Magadan. We must work tirelessly from the ground up. <clears throat> 
in this Russia. Crazed with pain, we are once again forced to resort to using smuggled goods and arms from Western and Japanese markets to prop up our republic. Plus, faced by enemies on all sides, our failure to secure American support in our struggle against warlordism and the Siberian wilderness are telling of how truly alone we are in this fight for supremacy in this corner of the world. With a firm resolve to improve our misfortune, Mikhail Mikoski turns his eyes to other markets, local and international, to attract the flow of arms and supplies to our domain. Ever to brave the brutality of the eastern wastes, the port of Magadan, our lifeline of, for our regime's governance for, over the region, must not run dry of foreign goods. Let's hope our luck turns for the better. And the world beckons. With the promises made to the dysphoria, the trade deals we forged across the international community, and our adaptation of a staunch anti-Japanese stance in the world politics, it seems that for the first time in a long time, the world's eyes rest upon Russia, and not just any Russia, but our Russia. The National Republic has come a long way from the desperate existence that we are eking out the uh, mere years ago. We've destroyed our old rivals, vanquished the remnants of the Soviet Union, not to mention besting the crazed cultists and their en enigmatic leader. Now that we've established ourselves both domestically and internationally, the world beckons to the National Republic, and we will not hesitate to step forth. Nice. Another tank, huh? Or oh, I guess it's motorized this one. <clears throat> Look at that flag. Wow. Kind of cool. Not going to lie, kind of cool. Um, go with more gun stuff for now. It's fine. The world beckons. I won't go to war now. Oh, uh, this one, yeah. More consumer goods. You guys are just hanging out, huh? Um, honestly, let's go here. Oh, wait, we just go to war immediately? Holy crap, I didn't realize we could go to war immediately. Oh, do we go to war with all of them at the same time? Oh. Oh, well, whatever. Burgundian bunkers. Cool, I like Burgundian bunkers. Oh, look at that manpower. Oh, it's so nice having manpower now. Left hanging. The ice is disappearing away, whistle through all the DOS support of Magadan. The metal clang of flowing buoys rang through the bay, as only audible sound emits a crash of the foamy Pacific waters. With the exception of the occasional rocking smuggler vessel docked in the cold concrete harbor, the waters were simply left to the ships from the free world. Our crash rate had been ignored by the freedom-loving peoples of the West, and we're left with none to rely on but ourselves. Thus, we turn inward, surviving on the limited supplies we can gather from across the wilderness of Siberia. If we were to persist even in the most bitter colds of the East, we must look inwards and find the resources necessary for the preservation of our young republic, lest we descend into icy conflict and warlordism once again. We're going to make the best with what we have. Crap, that sucks. God dang it. Dang those other Western powers. They've chosen this fate to doom Russia. New, oh, look at this! New trade opportunities! Russian and Mikhail Mikoski's desk returned messages were delivered to Magadan from across the Pacific. We've heard back from our calls of support. The democracies of the free world have offered their hands to establish official diplomatic t relations with the Republic and begin official and informal communications in the next coming weeks. Shipping vessels dock in the icy port of Magadan bearing the flags of our foreign allies, arriving with hundreds of tons of supplies for our young Republic. Shaking hands with envoys and international observers, we've most certainly made a name for ourselves throughout the globe and found friends across the great Pacific Ocean. We are far from stable and cement position we work tirelessly towards, but our efforts to civilize and govern Siberia no longer go unnoticed by the observing free world. Things are starting to look up. Thank you, Canada. And same thing with Mexico. Screw America. We love Mexico and, and Canada. They are our new best buddies. Yes, yes, yes. And we're going to need a lot of political power here to just core stuff too, so. Help them out. Help them out. We don't want to lose too many guys here. Oh, also forgot. Planes. Increase weapon stuff. Nice. Um, do we have any extra casts? Yeah, we do. That's nice. You guys go here. I got any extra fighters? Nice. At least give them something to work with right now. Because we have literally nothing going on right now with these guys, so. Not bad. The world beckons, my friends. There's the future and beyond. High-ranking officials of the Foreign Ministry of the Siberian National Republic and gathered around a table, having been called together for a special meeting. Mm oh, look at that. We took out Kansk. They chatted among themselves, but quieted down with the foreign minister clear his throat, and looked to the superior gentleman, he began. You have all performed excellently these past few months, and I would first like to congratulate each and every single one of you. Though the, the gathered officials said nothing, not knowing not to interrupt the minister's speech, the mood lightened in the room, and proud smiles spread across a few faces. After giving them a good moment to process the praise, the foreign minister continued. However, more remains to be done. There is a relationship with the Washington to be deepened, as well as with the OFN in general. Moreover, retaking Vladivostok and the rest of the southeastern territories remains a priority for this administration. As such, I expect you to continue giving your best efforts these next few months as well. Is this understood? Of course, the agreements came from the seat officials. Good then. All of you dismiss. Russia no longer stands alone, and unfortunately, I'm sure as to this point, for some of you guys, I'm going to finish off this these wars off screen just because it's nothing really special. It's just, you know, reuniting the wastes. And if you follow my channel at all, you know I've done this quite a few times. It's great. It's fun. But, um,. 
in the next episode, we will reclaim all of Russia and begin pushing towards probably Germany. So, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when we will fight and reclaim and reunite all of Russia. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.